remember waited out or what? <laughs> I don't know. Hi, this is Dr. Otto Jenke, and this is a Cairo Rising. Uh, today, we have a special guest. It's Dr. Ian Bulow. Ian and I met uh, a couple years ago at the New York Lyceum, yeah. which I thought was a really cool uh, day in chiropractic in that, quite frankly, we just talked We talked to chiropractic, and no one was really selling from the stage, which is such a unique thing. And uh, yeah. we talked to chiropractic, and Ian blew our mind talking about uh, not only Blair uh, chiropractic adjustments and the techniques, but also cone beam. And we're going to take a couple looks at that in a little bit. Uh, it's going to blow your mind. And if you've never seen this stuff, I'd recommend that you uh, strap in and get an extra uh, extra uh, seat belt because it's going to be kind of cool. First of all, Ian, thanks for being with us today. Absolutely, brother. Thanks for having me. Ian, where'd you go to school? Palmer. When'd you graduate? 2008. So coming up on, actually, we just thought this February was our 10 year graduation anniversary and then October will be the 10 year anniversary for the practice. While at Palmer, how, why did you, what led you into, into Blair? Uh, so at the beginning of fourth try, which is the beginning of the second year, um, we have toggle class. And um, I honestly thought that the reason they were teaching it was because this crazy guy who didn't wash his hair, BJ Palmer, uh, tried, you know, who tried to kill his dad and all that fun stuff uh founded the school so that must be why they're teaching upper cervical why else would you look at two bones and not look at the whole spine right so but and that was at the beginning of the trimester by the end of the trimester i had um gotten into the delta sigma chi fraternity and started understanding the philosophy started making my mind my mind was starting to get twisted a little bit you know in a good way or untwisted i should say and um at the end of that i kind of liked i now upper cervical kind of made sense because it jived with the philosophy and I asked a buddy of mine, I said, what should I take? What elective? Fifth try. He goes, well, did you like Toggle? And I said, well, yeah, I like Toggle. Toggle is a cool class and all that. And he goes, well, you should try, take a look at Blair. I said, why? What's that about? And he's like, well, it's like a badass Toggle. <laughs> and I was like, all right. All right. I'll try. Uh, I'll go see what Blair's all about. And um, so I got into Blair and, and, and the analysis is what kind of sealed the deal. The Blair analysis, which I'll show you in a little bit here, is just, it kind of ruined me for anything else, really. And then from there on out, I was just, I couldn't go anywhere else. I just Blair ever since. And so you're, you're a Blair practitioner and you started day one as a Blair practitioner in your office? Yeah. And, and it's, so it's been a crazy, crazy long and, and very um, blessed journey with amazing mentors along the way. But um, yeah, so through school, I did pretty much all upper cervical, palmar upper cervical, like HIO work, toggle and all that. I was mentored by a lot of knee, chest, and toggle guys. So I've always been very thermal pattern based and very conservative. And um, went through the first five years with that style of practice side posture, drop, uh, toggle, Blair, mainly Blair with a little bit of toggle. And then, um, and then I was blessed and fortunate to have the opportunity to go through the upper cervical diplomate program that the ICA has. And that just like completely expanded my mind and um, got into. So now I, I practice with a primarily Blair, Blair analysis and primarily Blair adjustments. But as most people will mature, no matter what technique they use, they'll realize that it's not about the technique. It's about whoever the founder of the technique, they knew something, you know what I mean? And they were really good at something at one area. And, um, but when you step outside of that area for a little bit, you start looking around, you start looking at the whole spine and the whole body and the whole issue going on from these different perspectives. So now I, I would say that, uh, no, we're, we're Blair practice still, but it's, it's the way we look at the spine is in a very holistic way. You know what I mean? Looking at it from a little bit of every different model within upper cervical and full spine a bit, but yeah, you, talk, Blair. you talked about it at the Lyceum that, uh, uh, it'd be great if all the, uh, upper cervical heads all got together and, and yeah. uh, communicated and I'll share the research and the, the techniques. Yeah. And it's happening. It's happening. It's already happening. I mean, but it's really culminating. There's going to be, I'll give a shout out to the symposium in uh, June. There's going to be the ISA council is putting on its first symposium that's run by the council on upper cervical in San Diego. And it's, I mean, it's crazy, man. Roy Croft's going to be there who does all the whiplash stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, not Roy Croft, uh, uh, Croft. I can't remember his first name, but Art Royce, Croft. was that? Art Croft. R. Croft, R. Croft, and then uh, Scott Rosa. I was getting my R's all messed up. Scott Rosa is doing the upper MRI stuff. Um, Jeff Schulten's going to be doing some cone beam stuff. Um, 
it's it's going to be really top notch. But that's that's the byproduct of the last ten years of bringing all the upper cervical people together. Sure. Not everybody's still coming to the table, but I would say eighty to ninety percent are, which is sure. pretty awesome. So take a deep dive into this, some of the stuff you want to show us today. This is going to be cool yeah. stuff, and then uh, then we're going to look at some cone beam. And if people have not seen cone beam, uh, and if you don't think that subluxations exist, then <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> shit, man. That's a, it's amazing. Yeah. It's funny, man. It, it, it's, yeah. I don't know. It, 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 I just like dealing in objective and valid metrics. So Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I'll cool show stuff. it to you. You can believe it or not, but I can show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. It's one thing so. you, you can say, it, but, you know, you showed uh, at the Lyceum, you showed the um, – uh, some of the views on just the condos, and it's like, holy crap. But go ahead. Yeah, man. so I'm going to show you some pretty awesome stuff here. And uh, the first thing I'm going to give you is a quick overview. For those of you watching, they should be able to see the screen here. This is going to be a condensed version of my one-hour upper cervical presentation, which so I'm going to condense it down into 10 minutes. So we're going to fly through a lot of it. But I want you to get the idea of what we're looking at. Um, and if you look at the screen right now, this is all my information. So if you want to follow up with me, please feel free. Um, Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so that's my crew. Those are my girls. I love them dearly, and that's why I do what I do. Um, I am in Pittsburgh. I started off in 2008, 10 years ago, and my practice, if you look at these these picture series, like most practices, you know, you get out in the community, you shake hands, you kiss babies, you give away a bunch of free shit in your practice. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> if we your podcast is a cursing one, but sometimes I curse. You're allowed but to. Like, you know, you give a bunch of stuff away, you have a bunch of dinners. Um, you're just kind of one of many. Um, and I'm not downing us as a profession. I think we serve our communities and we love people. Um, but it's a lot of hard work. And it's a, you're just, you're just, sometimes you get into the rat race. And maybe on another call we can talk about business and brand. But at the end of the day, it, things started to shift. So this was the group that started. And then this was. Slight uh, misrecording right there. I'm huge right there, aren't I? So due to the, uh, the uh, greatness of technology, we had a little blow out there on technology, <laughs> but we're back on again with Dr. Bulow. Ian, go right ahead, please. All right, guys. Sorry about that. But basically, um, about five years ago, the ICA started the Upper Cervical Diplomate Program. Council on Upper Cervical, and this was the class, um, some really great doctors. Uh, when it finished, uh, the class that finished was a really tight-knit group of some of the best people in Upper Cervical. I mean, if you look across there, you've got people that are technique leaders, presidents of different societies, and most probably importantly, progressive and humble, man. You put your money where your mouth is, you pay tuition, you travel around the country. Why? Because you want to learn more and you want to give more. So just sure. amazing people. And you'll notice the clinic up here, um, it's 1,300 square feet. It's not a huge monster. It's a tight clinic, but it's got everything that you need for upper cervical. It's got an imaging room, a post-rest room, an adjusting room, and an office, and then a kid's room and a reception. But what I want you to notice is just the branding of it. Um, and maybe, again, I, maybe I mentioned this before we the call went off, but um, just branding, you know, first impressions and just overall branding, right? trying to elevate our game and our the perception of the public, what they think of chiropractic in general. Um, so that's that. Now, I currently teach the work. I love Sherman College. We've got a lot of great things going on. Um, and I love meeting new people. Um, and that's that guy, Tristan. So shout out to Tristan. That was the presentation. That is the presentation I gave. I don't normally have Tristan's photo. That's all right. Um, I, I deleted a lot of these slides. <laughs> you like that one, huh? Um, Good friend of mine. So yeah, no, he's great. So the, uh, again, some of these things I'm just going to go through because we don't have to go through it all right now. This is an hour long presentation. I'm going to go over in 10 minutes, but the bottom line is I'm really into upper cervical. And the reason is because the foundational purpose of chiropractic is to express life. You know what I mean? And that we know starts in the brain and so upper cervical is that first point of interference that can cause a whole wreck of problems. Um, so we maintain on that. 
And then um, we look at above, down, inside, and out, not just in the whole body, but the spine itself. And what got me into it in the beginning was really the crazy cases. You know, you look back at over the last 100 years of chiropractic, and there's been some crazy cases. And, and a lot of them, usually a lot of the miracle cases happens when people get the upper neck right, you know. Um, and this was James Tomasi, man, God bless him. He had trigeminal neuralgia for 10 years, 12 years, actually, and was going to kill himself. And sure. he wrote a book called What Time Tuesday, just a really crazy, awesome book. But um, so the crazy, the craniosacral cervical junction is kind of the, the technical term for it. We call it upper cervical and chiropractic, but the rest of the world calls it the craniosacral junction because it really embodies not just the bones, but all the blood vessels and nerves and fluids that go in and out of your skull. So it's a pretty loaded area. So it becomes really important for us and what we do because that's the inception point of life, you know? Sperm and egg meet, and nine months later with pickles and ice cream, you've got a whole new organism, you know what I mean? With 75 trillion cells, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, it's pretty miraculous. But the main thing here is that it starts and ends in the brainstem, right? Within a matter of a couple of weeks, I think, or so, you've got the neural tube, the primitive streak right here, you know, and that forms your your brainstem and that's really where the rest of the body evolves from you know it's that master control center when we look at that autonomic chart um, but it really keeps us going um, so when most people think of the brain they think of the brain being the cortex of the brain when we talk about the brain we're talking more about the brainstem and that regulating organ um, and it's important for our philosophy because it really is what stimulates the rest of the brain into function you know, this, this amazing study that Heidi Havoc came out with back in 2016 was showing how when people had their cervical spine adjusted, um, there was changes in the perception, the somatosensory perception um, in your prefrontal cortex. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they had like little leads on the hands and they'd stimulate it and the, they had leads up at the top that would measure the responses. And there were these changes after they had the neck adjusted compared to people who didn't have the neck adjusted. So you're literally changing your perception of your world when you get adjusted. Like, yeah, boom, <laughs> that's, that's freaking huge. I don't know if that's not big. I don't know what's big. If I had time to show you this video, I would. But this is a video of a guy who's literally carried into an office, like completely out. He has these myoclonic seizures where he's just like out. They carry him in, set him up on an, an upper cervical table. He has, has his atlas adjusted. And you can see his arms. Literally, he wakes up. He's literally brought back to consciousness. I mean, not quite brought back to life, but to consciousness. And it's, it's incredible. Um, that video is um, done by Dr. Craig York. If you look him up and you might be able to find his video, if you find his Facebook page. Um, so brain, ridiculously important, in line with our chiropractic goals and objectives, right? Um, supported by a ton of cardiac output, a lot of oxygen, um, supported by the cerebrospinal fluid that kind of washes your brain and cleanses the brain, um, supported by the veins, which drain all the waste away. You know what I mean? So you have these arteries come in. As they beat, they create CSF. The CSF does its thing, cleans up the brain, dumps off the waste in the veins, and the veins drain it out. So it's this beautiful like harmony of fluids that kind of pulse in and out of your skull. Um, that becomes really stinking important because – when we start investigating what happens at the cranius cervical junction, the upper cervical spine, we start to see, hold on a second, when you have these bones that are so mobile, you read it in the research here, the, this cranius cervical junction is a potential, this should be is, not in, is a potential choke point for blood and CSF flow. Well, that's pretty flippin' important, right? You can see it on MRIs here where you can have the transverse process literally compressing the internal jugular vein. And these images from Dr. Scott Rosa, um, these are educational purposes only. If he sees you use this as a tactic to get new patients in the door, expect a phone call. He's not, Scott Rosa's, yeah, don't do that. So don't try not to take, don't take any screen capture of this and put it on your Facebook and say, hey, this is what I do. Right. It's a sensitive subject there. That's why it's copyrighted here. But what I want you to see is internal jugular vein over here. Now, this is on the left because you're reading it like a medical doctor anatomically from bottom up. Left internal jugular, nice and open. And you come over here to the other side, you're reading left, but the right anatomically, and that sucker is closed off. You know, what does that do to someone's consciousness? Um, you can see the backup of CSF. The CSF 
right in here, this white right here is uh, shouldn't be there. The sheath of the optic nerve shouldn't have that bulging of the CSF. But when you choke where the CSF pulses in and out, you're going to have some trouble. Um, we see that in people with multiple sclerosis. Um, then what will happen in whiplash is the cerebellum will drop down inside the frame and magnum. It should not go below this line. This is a patient of mine. I believe it's a hockey player, if I remember correctly. This is looking straight down the frame and magnum in a base posterior kind of view. Oh, wait, nope, 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 nope. Sorry. This is, we're still in medical view here. This is a, a MRI, a, a, a medical MRI. So looking from the bottom up now but that is the frame and magnum, spinal cord, and these are those cerebellar tonsils, same one as here, just sagging down and clogging that drain pipe. If it's clogged bad, and bad enough, the vertebral arteries can actually compress and distort the uh, cord as well. Uh, and why does that matter? Jeez, oh man. Um, it matters in a big way, but look at this. These, these are, uh, this is a study in uh, kids that were later on found to have be on the spectrum and there was a correlation between infants that had either small brains or extra CSF and conditions like autism spectrum disorders. So the flow of your cerebral spinal fluid is not only linked to multiple sclerosis, which I think uh, maybe it's a later slide. Give me a second here. Ah, it's not in there. Like I said, we're flying through this anyhow, but multiple sclerosis, but autism. And when you look at the cerebral spinal fluid and what it does for you, it washes away that waste. So when you talk about like Alzheimer's disease and um, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy in the NFL players, a lot of that has to do with the fact that their brain is just not, the fluid dynamics aren't working. They get that placking, that extra crap in their brain. And it's like, could it be that the CSF is choking and it's not is being choked, so the fluid is not able to go in and pulse through the cracks and crevices of the brain to clean that crap away over the course of the day and then over the course of their life. And that's why they're having these extra tau proteins in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all this stuff. It could be because we see results with these patients, we see improvements, and it just so happens that a lot of them have had these concussions and whiplash injuries. So it's kind of like we got to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Ian, let's 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 dive into that just for a moment because that, that, of course that's a massive uh, massive social social aspect in that for the dementia and Alzheimer's. But yeah, not, not that we're curing that. But what we're saying is what you're saying is is if the upper cervical, that the frame and magnum itself, the hole itself is not its appropriate size, then the fluid mm -hmm. can't get up and the fluid can't get out correctly. Yeah, this here, I'll show you this picture right here is actually a fluid map. Um, you can find this on the Phonar website, F-O-N-A-R, they're the company that manufactures MRIs. And um, I want you to think about this, this space like a garden hose. And the fluid pulsing in and out of the skull is a, is a very low and gentle pulse, kind of goes with your heartbeat and your respiration, right? And think of it like a garden hose that's having a little bit of water trickling through. If you put your thumb over that garden hose, in the beginning, nothing's gonna happen because there's not a lot of back pressure. But if you keep it over the hose, then inside the hose, the water starts filling up and now it starts squirting out with a little bit of velocity. See what I'm saying? So this picture on the left is before having an upper cervical correction, an upper cervical adjustment. This picture on the right is after. And you can see the velocity, the pulsing of that fluid prior, and then you can see it after. So pretty big difference there. And it's so funny when we talk about this stuff, man, we start talking about, um, you know, um, garden hoses and things like that this is all the stuff bj was talking about and no it's not bone on cord but it's bone on fluid on cord you know what i mean and that's and bj talks about in the green books he talks about hydrostatic um hydrostatic or hydraulic uh, hydraulic pressure gradients and how their hydraulic pressure can move automobiles and you know, all this kind of stuff and that's what we're seeing here in this in the brain so yeah absolutely can have a negative effect for sure cool very cool so all of this stuff is protected by your skull. It's kind of an interesting thing when you have the head, like this one here, kind of cool. Um, but it's completely sealed off to the world, except for these small holes with the biggest one at the base of the skull. But if you think about it, it's completely a protected system because it houses the most important area of your body. And so we've got bones now. So we have blood, we have fluid, and now we've got bones. Those bones continue down the spine they are wrapped in a bunch of ligaments. Again, please no, do not screen capture this and put it on your Facebook pictures. I will hunt you down. 
Um, but they're, they've got these ligaments that hold it all together. And the reason I like this photo is because I want people to understand that the neck is primarily, the only thing keeping you from doing a 360 degree carry move is that it's these ligaments, it's this soft tissue, right? So when you have a trauma, and there's a lot of them, when you have a trauma, these ligaments can get damaged and torn and loosened and weakened. So people that have an upper cervical subluxation, I want you to think about it like an instability. I don't think of it anymore like being stuck or locked. I think of it as being disjointed, disjointed in an aberrant range of motion. I mean, if it was stuck, you wouldn't be able to move your head, right? This right. motion is atlas octopus motion. This is atlas C2. So if it was glued stuck, you wouldn't be able to do any of that. But you can do it. It's just in an aberrant, off-hinge, weak sort of way, like having a bum knee. Um, you can see all of this stuff on MRIs if you know what to look for. Um, you can see it in motion studies. But those bones are wrapped around by muscles. Those muscles are really important um, because they tell the brain what the heck's going on when it comes to your posture. You've got those muscle spindle fibers, those things that go in and tell the cerebellum. You know, if I go here, it tells me where my hands are. In your neck, you're chock full of them. Um, a couple hundred per gram as opposed to a trapezius that has two. So literally 200 times more muscle spindle fibers in the upper cervical area as opposed to the shoulder area. A lot of people have that shoulder pain in here. Here's my interpretation. You've got a misalignment, suboccipitals, way too small to correct the head, but they can call upon the grunt workers of the traps, levator scapula, all these guys to pull that bowling ball back on center. But of course, now we're going to say, oh man, it hurts really right here. Can you just you just crack this right in here, it'll feel so much better. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I gotta go. This, this is what I tell students. They say, what about the pelvis? And you say, ah, the cerebellum. All I'm saying is do <laughs> cervical syndrome. Simple test, that's all I'm saying. You don't gotta go upper cervical, but just do cervical syndrome. If they're lying prone and you go right and left and those legs jump around, it's like, hello, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's screaming, there's people that have, come in with a half inch short leg right and they've got right hip pain and right sciatica they turn to the left and it gets balanced i literally tell them we can either fix what's in your neck or you can look to your left for the rest of your life just look to your left you'll be set you know you'll be good <laughs> you'll be good so um full <laughs> spine thermals um so the bottom line is there's a lot going on right there's a lot going on in this area that's what excites me about the area um now, there's different ways that we can look at the area to see if there's a subluxation at the top. I love thermal imaging. I really do um, because it's just objective. You know what I mean? If you got an asymmetrical issue going on in terms of your temperature, what controls that? Well, it's capillary dilation. What controls the capillaries? Your sympathetic nervous system. What controls the sympathetics? Your brain stem. There's like two steps between innate intelligence and the temperature of your skin. You know what I mean? There's not as many variables. Right. And I can measure it today, tomorrow, next week, next year, and get, and multiple doctors, 100 different doctors can come in and scan the same patient. They should get the same findings. So it's very reliable and it's very valid. So I really love um, looking at pattern work. Um, we also look at the posture. If your head goes crooked, your shoulders and hips will often compensate for that. So we kind of take a look. Um, imaging, you can look at it from an orthogonal standpoint. Orthogonality means that you're, genetically designed to be head over your neck with the atlas in between, which is probably true. You're probably genetically designed to be that way. However, whether it is genetic imbalances or whether it is the stresses of life, the reality is, is that we are very rarely actually perfectly symmetrical beings. It's kind of like looking at a tree. A tree may be, be designed to grow in a symmetrical fashion, but due to the winds and the, and the rains and the storms, and the light and the sun, everything gets bent and turned and twisted in different directions. And I think it's the same with the spine. Due to accidents, injuries, birth processes, subluxations, things are gonna compensate over time. They're going to adapt. And what it leaves us with is a population where the majority of people um, are actually not formed perfectly symmetrical. So in the, in the Blair work, we start off with the premise that um, because the body is formed asymmetrical, when it looks left and right, we're gonna look at the joints themselves. Um, here's an example here of two wonderful women. They look gorgeous, but they're actually mirror images of this person over here. 
So it's just saying that this person's, these two faces in the middle and the right are actually perfectly symmetrical. It doesn't happen in reality. This is reality over here. Right. So based on the, this is a, just a showing you how the condyles of the occiput can be different. And if the condyle here is straight up forward, then when that atlas misaligns forward, it goes straight forward. But if the condyle is turned, then when that atlas misaligns, it's going to go in a, in a lateral, uh, anterior lateral function or direction. Um, and so what we do to see those misalignments, and I'm not going to go through it too much, is we take these custom x-rays. We see on the left and on the right how much those condyles are turned so that we set them up. This would be looking like from the ceiling down. Uh, an A to P x-ray, this would be your x-ray tube. This would be the bucky. We rotate the patient perfectly in line with that condyle. So the x-ray beam comes straight down their left condyle. And that gives us a view that looks like this. So their chin is to the left, because again, just like this one, the chin is to the left, see how the nose points left. Yeah. So that's the teeth here to the left. And so this right here is you're looking at the actual joint. You're actually looking, this dark space between the red lines is the, is the fluid cavity between the occiput, the left condyle, and the left lateral mass. Wow. And so what happens is left and right can be different, but top to bottom should be the same. It doesn't matter what left and right compare as, but top to bottom, those articular margins should be the same especially when you're talking about the anterior lateral margin right over here on the atlas. It's a very clean and crisp rim of the atlas, and the condyle is also very clean and crisp. So if we rotate the patient and we look down that margin, we can see if it slipped or not. And this is just an uh, animation that'll show it kind of slipping up into the left. That would be like an ASL, right? Now, here's where we go to cone beam. And I can show you guys, um, a couple samples of x-rays like this one on the left, but that we don't have enough time. I could show you, but the, the reason I would show you is I want you to understand that this is very reliable. If I get 100 different x-rays of 100 different people and I get a bunch of 100 different doctors, the reliability of them calling the same listing is pretty darn high. Like most people should be able to say, yes, that's an AL ASL or that's a PIR or that's an ASR or that's a PIL, or that's a combination of adjust, you know, of, of listings. With a high reliability, multiple doctors should be able to call the same thing, which is great because in chiropractic, like I said, we need two things. We need validity. What we say should mean what we think it said, we, what we think it means. And then we need reliability, right? If I say, I'm going to put a pen on everyone's head, and if it falls off, they're subluxated you would have really high reliability. If it stays on, they're not subluxated. If it falls off, they are. A hundred different doctors, they can all adopt that system. Super high reliability, but zero validity, right? Zero validity. Right. So we kind of want both. We want it to mean what we think it means, but we also need agreeability. You know, we have a lot of good concepts, but then we have doctors that know it's a right listing or it's a left listing or it's this or it's that. This stuff is just, there's no lines on this image. There's line drawing to get your condylar angles, but on the blare, uh, it's called a protracto view, or you could call it an oblique nasium. There's no lines. You look at it, and you just look to see if that corner is above or below the occiput on the right side, and then above or below the occiput on the left side. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, and I don't care what your technique is. If you want to know 100% certain that that atlas is forward and to the right, forward to the left, back and the right, back and the left, or a combination of the above, this here, is factual. There's no opinions. There's no maybes. It just is. So it's a, it's a really awesome way of looking at the upper cervical. Now in comb beam, it's even more precise. So here would be the uh, AO joint on the left lined up. Here it would be massively subluxated or massively misaligned. Um, this here is just huge. Um, this is the right side lined up, and this would be the right side misaligned right over here. Now, it can also misalign underneath the occiput. It's just more rare. Um, most of them are in anterior fashion, which, by the way, again, you don't have to do upper cervical, quote unquote. But let me just tell you 80% or more of these atlases are anterior and superior relative to the occipital condyles. That's just the way it is, which means a posterior to anterior adjustment on the atlas. If you're going off of a fixation theory that it is just 
aberrant motion and you've got to free it up to restore proper affrontation, that's fine. If you're going off a tonal model, that's fine. But if you're talking about misalignment, like directional misalignment, right, left, forward, back, just be aware that it's probably 30% laterality and 70% anteriority in most cases. So just, just be aware of that. So if someone's not responding with a traditional rotary style atlas maneuver, you might want to attempt a side posture toggle, a Gonstead transverse contact, or something that addresses more laterality with a little A to P, as opposed to a majority P to A with a little laterality. Just, just throwing it out there, especially with tough cases. Um, now we're getting into the really sexy stuff. This is actually what cone beam looks like. Um, you have it in 3D. You can also bring about the skin surface, which is just sick. Because what happens now is, if you want to make sure you can actually contact the thing you think you're contacting, you know what I mean? We say, hey, we're on the atlas, but maybe you're on the transverse of C2, right? So this, again, in tough cases, I just had my first referral from a chiropractor down the street who has a gal um, for a variety of reasons who wanted a cone beam scan. So she came out, had a focused exam, cone beam, and now she's going back to her chiropractor or, or the other chiropractor down the road. For your tough cases, this will answer a lot of questions. It's no longer, um, is it to the right? Is it, like I said, it's no longer the question. And then there's a the question of contact points, safety. How about this one? This is a referral from a, a family Ian, a chiropractic student. Ian, let's go back just one step. Yeah. So it's a cone beam CAT scan, correct? Yes. So it's a cone beam CAT scan, and we take that, and it's it's a 360 view. Yep. And so... I'm, I'm uh, sitting there by my, uh, sitting there, um, and it goes around me? Yeah, I actually, um, nah, my uh, webcam won't go that far. But yes, it looks like, it looks almost like a panoramic dental x-ray. You sure. know what I mean? And in fact, it was initially designed for facial and maxillofacial surgeons and dental surgeons. So it's, you, you sit or stand, and you have, and it's x-ray. It's x-ray technology. So you have a cathode diode set up over here where you have an, x-ray emit, emitting beam, um, a tube, you know, and then over here you have a panel, just like you would. But the difference is it goes around your head 360 degrees, and it's doing light intermittent bursts of exposure. You know, when it goes, it pop, 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 it goes all the way around. And when it, then the computer adds it up, and now you have 360 degrees of imaging. Now it's different because it's conical. So traditional CT, the receptor over here is thin like this. So the, the, the radiation will come around in a slice and it'll keep slicing right. higher and higher and higher and higher, right? right? Cone beam comes through with one fan, one beam, like, a, like an ice cream cone, a sugar cone on its side, it conical comes out like that. So it only has to go around one time. So it's actually less radiation, a lot less radiation. How long does that take? Than a regular CT. And um, it's probably comparable um, to a full spine series of films of X-rays. Um, it's or, or, or less. It's it's the same or less as a standard Blair series. In Blair, we take five to nine cervical X-rays. This is less than what we were taking with our other setup. How long does the whole scan take, Ian? Oh yeah. How long does it take? <laughs> I'll make you laugh. Um, I used to spend twenty to thirty minutes taking my views. Um, now it takes two minutes in the room. Two minutes? Two minutes. And literally the scan the scan itself takes about 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. But and then how long does it take for the computer to uh, generate a picture like that? 30 seconds, a minute, something like that. Um, now it'll take me about half an hour to analyze it. Oh, sure. Oh, so sure. much data, and I'm obsessive that way, um, that it still takes a long time to get the job done. But yeah, the te technical aspect. Now I will say here though, please hear me. There's... There's a lot of work that needs to be done in the profession to get this accepted across the board in all 50 states as a, uh, as, as, as a proper way of imaging and chiropractic. Sure. Um, in short, all I'm saying is, if you care about this technology, I would implore you to go to icaupperservical.com and be, get involved become a member and join the subcommittees that are the committees that are involved. We have a committee now,
dedicated to getting this in one of our chiropractic colleges so that we can point back to it on the state level and say, this is now the new standard of care or a standard of care within our profession, right? right. Um, this is really, really important stuff. And we could either just move on and just practice and just do what we do, or we can actually give back with your ta talents, ties, or what is it? Your, what, what's, the, what's the saying there? You give back with your time, your talents, your time, or your ties, your money. Um, but if you care about this, you think it's valuable, show up, be involved, right? Sure. There's a guy named Tyler uh, Evans who's really heading this up, and uh, we could use your help. So that being said, looks like this. Why it matters? Well, here's one case. This is a gal, uh, her, her, her sister is a chiropractic student and not doing, not responding so well, has all kinds of issues. Maybe you can see why, but this is the atlas. This is the right condyle, anterior margin of the frame and magnum. And then what the heck is that? That right there, I like to call an occipital tooth. It's a, it's an accessory joint. It's a pseudo joint. It's a, it's extra bone, man. Whether it's genetic, or whether it was traumatic. I think it's genetic though. It looks like it's got some condylar, um, no, not condylar, but um, some cortical bone. Um, but my point is, how would that feel in flexion? If you try to flex that occiput down, it's literally gonna ram right into the anterior arch of the atlas. Right. You know? um, here's a kid. Um, obviously you can see things are off kilter. Um, when I did his cone beam analysis, I was looking at the facets and I came around to the right facet and realized, holy smokes, his C2 and C3 are completely fused. His C3 is rocking back on C4 in a massive fashion. He was swimming backstroke in the water and, and ran into another kid's head just like that. And he didn't have the genetic uh, ability to adapt to that stress because he didn't even have the, half, he didn't have the joint in his neck. Watch this. This, get this now, this is what cone beam is all about. We look at this and say, dang, is that fused? What's going on? You can actually slice through it. This is looking at him from A to P now, removing his vertebral bodies and looking at the lamina by themselves. And you can see how C2 is completely fused with C3 on the right-hand side. Just unbelievable. Wow. Just unbelievable. Stuff. Now, again, how would that palpate? You get on C2 spinous and start motioning it and say, boy, oh boy, that C2 is really stuck on the right. It's freaking fused, you know. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's stuck. And again, it's and I'm not I'm not saying you got to do upper cervical, and I'm not saying you got to have cone beam, and I'm not even saying you have to have X-ray. I'm just saying you have to be aware of these things, so that if there are people that aren't responding well, it's not that up. Uh, I guess it's limitation. Well, oh, this is limitations of matter, but it's not that like. Oh, I guess it's yeah. Your innate just can't overcome this, but we're still going to check you three times a week for the rest of your life. It's like. No, like there's stuff you can check and see. You know what I mean? It doesn't make you a medical doctor. It just makes you a next level chiropractor. Right. Just look at the anatomy, man. We got, it's not, these aren't medical tests. You know what I mean? MRIs and CTs don't belong to medical doctors. They belong to society. And we can, be, we can use them if we deem necessary. And, right. and a lot in these tough cases, they, they should. They deserve that. They need that. So just being aware of that kind of stuff. There's different ways to adjust an upper cervical. The Blair adjustment itself, um, I don't know if, I probably won't play the, I won't, I won't, there's a video here, but I'm not going to play it because it wouldn't come across, I'm sure, it just moves too fast. Sure. Um, but the Blair adjustment kind of does look like a toggle, but it, it has that 180 degrees of torque in the hands. It actually kind of looks like how the videos of BJ when he was adjusting knee chest and even side posture, he would torque his hand a lot. Um, but that's what Blair looks like. It, it looks like that style of adjustment in a side posture. Um, but this is what I was saying. We want people to come to the table. Now, I will say this. I will say this. Not all of these associations are affiliates of the Upper Cervical Council. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that all of these people are. All I'm saying is that's the vision. The vision is that you have a council dedicated to bringing resources together for the betterment of specific chiropractic in the upper cervical spine. And what we'd like to see are all of these associations come to the table and participate. 
Um, so if you're looking into upper cervical, here are some that you could start off with. I mean, there's more than this. Um, but one of my questions, if I were you and I was going to them, I would say, hey, this is great. By, by the way, are you guys affiliate members of the upper cervical council? And if they say no, they may have reasons, but none of them are good enough for me. I don't know. And that might be, I don't know, you take it for what it's worth, but that's just my opinion. Um, they're doing a lot of good things, a lot of research. This is a really cool study. If you see this graph, I just want to say one thing about it. It's really cool, though. It shows the force and time profiles of the different techniques. Um, but I do want to point out the top, the sensor was not on a drop headpiece. So when you see toggle and blare at 30 pounds of force, that's, that's not an accurate representation. When you, when you use the, the toggle sensor on top of a drop headpiece, it actually comes down to about four to six pounds of pressure. Um, it's just the difference between toggling without that give and not having that give. And so don't let people tell you like, oh, toggle and blare is this you know, karate chop or whatever. It might look scary, but it's literally four to six pounds of pressure in a tenth of a second. So you really barely feel a thing. Most right. patients barely feel a thing. Right. Um, but the point is, though, that we're doing research. The council's doing research to quantify all of this stuff. Why do some techniques work better in some cases than others? You know what I mean? Is it the practitioner? Is it the application? Is it limitations of matter? These are all questions that we got to answer. Um, let me show you a couple cone beams, and then I'm sure we are pushing our time limit. Right. This here is what it looks like. Um, I'm going to delete it somewhere here. And so what's incredible is you can look all the way around in 360 degrees. Um, and even more than that, let me put the crop function on. Hold on. Let me change a couple things here. So even more than that, we can actually um, do some really sexy things here in a second. It's got to load. This is not the computer I use to analyze, so it, it is taking a little longer. But if you were to come, you could even come down here. And this is what BJ was doing with, with the wet specimen. He was wanting to go down and look down the canal, you know? And so we can Bizarre. actually come in here. Bizarre, isn't it? It's unreal, man. So we can come down the canal and we can see all the way down the different segmental levels. All the way down. And then, like I said, with the other patient that I had, you could come back here. And if you wanted to see inside the spine, you could see how much rotation is in here. A really wicked amount of rotation but you can even come in on the inside of the spine if you so chose to and then look at the IVFs. See what I'm saying there? And then with those articular views, first of all, with the lower cervicals, and this is actually a good thing that we're going over this because there's an important thing that we should go over with lower cervicals. When we look at, and by lower cervicals, I mean C2 to C7. Or, or C5 or so. In Blair, we look at the facets. So if I were to zoom in and just look at, let me fix the, get the grain out of here. So if I were to come in here, what I want you to notice is C2 how the, how the facet rides up and over on the right-hand side right there. See that? Yeah. And so when we look at it from a P to A perspective, we see that the spinuses are trending to the right. And now we can see why. We can see it's because that facet has ridden anterior. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if you came over here to the other side, and you said that spinous is right, probably because this facet rode posterior and you whacked it. Now this one here actually maybe rode posterior a little bit, but not really. Um, you'd be adjusting the wrong joint. You know what I mean? It's the right joint that's the problem, not the left joint, you know? And there is a difference in that. Or, or, or let's say because that side misaligned, it's all swollen. So then we put them again in a rotary position and then we pop that joint. 
Again, from a disaffrontation model and a fixation model, we may get some results there. But from a structural positional model, we may actually irritate and further misalign anteriorly and superiorly that already anterior and superior articulation. So we can go through the facets and see. And my point in saying all that is that in Blair, it's one of those, the only technique systems that I am aware of that recognize the anterior misalignment, not just posterior segments falling back, but looking at adjusting from the anterior, which we do sideline position. You just get on the, on the um, lamina pedicle, but on the pedicle there, just punch it back essentially. Um, so just an interesting, interesting thing there. Um, and then if you remember when we talk, I'll just say one other thing, if you remember when we were talking about the condyles right. and looking at the condylar views, yep. um, what we can do in, in with, uh, the cone beam, and in, in with Blair, you can do this with standard x-rays if you know how. If you're, if you're trained on it, you can do it. But with the, with the um, CT, what we're able to do, and I'm going to do this real general and real fast. This is not the way that it should be done, but I'm just going to do it real quick and real fast. We can come in here, and we can look at the articular margin. So here you'll see the dens or the anterior tubercle of the atlas right in the center, articulating with the dent. That makes sense, right? You're looking at a lateral, kind of mid-sagittal slice right through the middle. Yep. But now let's imagine that we have a little spaceship or a little ship inside the body there. And we say, all right, let's go walking around the, the bend. You know what I mean? Let's go take a look and take a peek at the right condyle. And look at that sucker, it, the atlas wedged up in front of the condyle on the right-hand side. And if I, let me double check where that is. You can see where it is right here. It's right in the front, right in the front. So the front of the lateral mass, I'm gonna shift this over here. The front of the lateral mass is shifted in front of the condyle on the right. And then we go around, keep walking on our journey all the way to the side. And we tip it a little bit, we tube tilt it. And now it's starting to line up a little bit better, but it's still a little bit off on that right-hand side. And then we can go around to the back. Now let's back up. Let's go into reverse. Now we say, all right, let's look at the left-hand side. What's the left condyle doing? Well, it too is a bit anterior on the front side there. Not as bad as the right, but it is anterior on the front a bit. Then we come around to the side of it. Well, the side's not so bad, you know, but it's still a little bit overlapped on the right-hand side. So this is an atlas that has gone forward and to the right primarily. But we can see it. My point is we can see it, you know. A regular Blair x-ray, the oblique nasium, would look something, it would look something like this here. You know what I mean? It's just a little bit more grayed out. But in the Blair work, one second, let me just clean it up a little bit if I can. But my point is, you could get an image that looks like this right here right. with a standard x-ray setup. A, a tilting bucky would help to get the right condylar angle. But you could do that. And you could see, yeah, it's a little bit forward on the, on the left. And then on the right-hand side, if we looped around, i got to switch the angle of the tube here. And then we'd see it forward on the right a little bit more severely right over here. So the point is you can see this stuff. Cone beam makes it sexy and makes it real time and we can really do some pretty incredible things. But I guess I want the take home message to be not that everybody needs to have a cone beam, everybody needs to do all this stuff. The point is just look, man, if you know what the anatomy is and you know what, um, what our objective indicators are, then you just get to work. And if things aren't moving at a pace that they should be moving. Like if you're not getting the person stable and responsive and holding their alignment within the first few weeks to the first few months, you got you should be checking in your work and checking your tests and seeing what else could be going on and talking with other chiropractors in your town and figuring out, just discussing these tough cases and doing that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and I suppose what I'll do with that said is I'll come back and I'll put this up one last time. Sure. Sure. Because uh, if folks want to follow up, if they have any questions, man, just let me know. Absolutely. Dr. Ian Bula, first of all, Ian, it's only a micro 
uh, it's a, milli, a, a micro millimeter off. How could that possibly be any problem whatsoever? Come on, man. You and I <laughs> both know that. It's not like the bone's dislocated, so it can't be that much, that much big of a problem, right? That's right. Oh, my gosh. I could, I could go into the physics of it if you want me to, but I don't think you really wanted me to. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's, that's, that'd be a quick eight hours, wouldn't it? That's right. <laughs> quick it eight hours. You suck, but yeah. Ian Buell, yeah, I'll let well, you know that uh, for all our friends out, out there who, um, who are skeptical of, of, of the, literally the bone out of place. Say that one more time. For, for our friends who are skeptical of the bone out of place. Oh man, no, it's it's pretty obvious, it's pretty clear, it's just science, you know. And we could say, well, that's just how they're positioned. So, well, you can say that. I just take that information, put a specific adjustment, clear the sympathetic nervous system, and they do better. That system tends to work really well, really consistently. And oh, by the way, I have messed it up where I would have the wrong patient card and I adjust them in an opposite way. And you pay for that. They come back and say, I don't know. Yeah, it just didn't work last time and all this stuff. So it's not, it's not, I mean, I think some things are just, yeah, the minor misalignments don't matter, but in the majority of cases, I think it matters greatly. And my, and what I tell patients is my goal for you is not just mobility. It is stability. And you could fall down a flight of stairs and got, get a heck of a lot of mobility, but that didn't do you any good in the long term. So how precise you want to be, that's your prerogative, but I think the only thing we have as chiropractors is our intent and our specificity. It's, it's why we do what we do, and we do it better than anyone else. So it may not matter to you, but it matters a heck of a lot to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So anybody who wants to contact Dr. Bueller, you've got the information right there. Absolutely. Uh, I'd highly recommend you take a look at this stuff, dive deep in it. This is going to be probably a video you're going to want to see a couple times just because of the in-depth and the and the information that com comes out. And by the way, Ian cut this down tremendously, <laughs> tremendously for us. Yeah. Uh, Ian Bulo, I truly appreciate your time, your love, your expertise, and your knowledge of, of the chiropractic. And uh, we can only hope that you keep your fire lit, my friend. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This has been Dr. Otto Jenke with A Cairo Rising. We recommend you become A Cairo Rising. Mm -hmm.